I'm Andrew George, uh, UNC Chapel Hill. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator. Um, I'm a social scientist. I'll probably say that a couple different times whenever I use that as a crutch to get around answering really direct, hard questions. Um, I work with uh, a team of folks at the Institute for the Environment, specifically a, a team called the Center for Public Engagement with Science. Um, other folks on my team, Dr. Kathleen Gray, Sarah Yelton, who are also members, uh, help me work with uh, different labs at UNC, also we work with some labs at Duke University, Go Tar Heels, uh, and most recently I've been working really closely with some folks up at uh, Virginia Tech, um, the Mark Edwards Lab, and if you guys are familiar with him, I'll tell you a little bit more, but uh, basically he's the lab that discovered a lot of the con lead contamination in Flint. So um, what I want to talk about today is really I'm going to emphasize two things, how we kind of developed a study to get more people testing their wells and then communicating the results back and then sometimes if we can provide an intervention or a filter that might improve their water quality, and then we uh, hold these meetings that, um, that are an opportunity for us to kind of explain the results in a way that's easily understood. Uh, my work generally is kind of bringing folks into the study and then helping them get the results and then helping explain the results. Uh, and to do that, I essentially help bring the scientists in the field and bring them to the communities that need it most. And my job essentially is many times is like a translator from like, academic to southern so many times. Um, <clears throat> so if, if, if I can do my job today, what I want to do is explain basically how we, des we designed a study to, drink, to address drinking water in private wells in North Carolina, how that study kind of it grew and, and we learned from our mistakes and we made it a little bit, um, I think, into a, an interesting model. And then I have a couple results that I'll share with you guys just so I'm sure you you, will, you won't want to hear about all these well tests and all these sampling without seeing some kind of interesting findings of some kind or another. Um, those findings are still as yet to be published, so uh, please don't snack any pictures and put them up on your Facebook page too soon. Okay, let's see if this thing works. All right, great. So uh, as I said, I work with the Institute for the Environment. We partner with a couple different labs. Um, most recently, when I came on board in 2014, 2015, uh, we were working with, with a team called the Superfund Research Project. Um, anybody familiar with that? Superfund is, uh, of course, um, an important uh, funding agency, a mechanism that gets resources to the most polluted communities. Um, and they, had, uh, they have a team at UNC uh, directed by Rebecca Fry, uh, which is this really incredible lab that has been doing well water work, actually, as far back as 2011. Um, they were actually some of the first work they did was to look at one of these kind of databases that were sitting on a shelf that nobody really done any analysis on. And it was essentially all these different well tests of private wells in North Carolina and, and the results. And so nobody had actually looked at them. And in North Carolina, about one out of four people get their, their water, their drinking water from a private well. And about one out of four of those people have some kind of contaminant in their water. So when we took this database for the first time, we found some interesting, you know, a little bit scary patterns of contamination. Most of it had to do with industrially, or I'm sorry, of naturally occurring or geogenic metals. So in North Carolina, we have naturally occurring arsenic that comes up just out of the ground. There's manganese, which is sometimes considered to be a, a nuisance metal, but there are, there's new data that says that it might have neurological effects on small children. So there's these, there was this data set, and nobody had really looked at it. And so the Fry Lab did some really great work and did, you know, spent days and months pulling down the data, crunching the numbers, maybe seeing if there's some correlation between the results and health effects, published it. And that really kind of got the Institute started on thinking about drinking waters in private wells. I came on board in 2015, and I'll just preface that by saying uh, 2010, I got my PhD at UNC looking at social science. Uh, Citizen engagement, public participation, federal lands decision making. So if you want to talk about democratic theory and agonistic mechanisms for democratic you know, work, I, I can dork out on that all day. But um, what I was able to do is kind of actually bring in some of those theories to help think about how we can bring um, the work into the field in the communities that need it most. And of course, in North Carolina, you guys are probably well aware that not too far from here, um, some of the beginning ideas about environmental justice started. Uh, and in, uh, the, the War Transformer site is a good example of how some industry was concentrated right near here, and then it was moved to a community that didn't want it, and that was already disproportionately burdened by levels of pollution, generally what's called an environmental injustice. So I was, I was really interested in those kind of mechanisms, and even before grad school, I should say that I worked in the field for different nonprofits in North Carolina, 
in Asheville in the 90s, which was really fun, working for different nonprofits, looking at um, Pisgah and Nantahala and air pollution issues and some other work that we did. So I, I kind of had an idea of how nonprofits work, how these environmental justice communities, um, what some of the interests that they had and the questions they, they had. And I was at this great lab working with some of these great scientists, and so we, we were able to bring them all together and, and design the study. And so uh, I was actually at one of these meetings, a community meeting, and I was, got there a little early, so all you know, high schoolers remember, it's not necessarily you know, who's there, but who gets there first and who you talk to. Uh, so I was there, and I just happened to be talking to this really nice person, and we were chit-chatting, and she's like, well, you know, I have a community that's, that's really got all these questions, because right around 2014, of course, there was the coal ash spill in the Dan River, um, 33,000 tons of coal ash spilled, and the state required testing around each one of these facilities around the state. There are about 14 other facilities that there were questions about groundwater contamination. This one uh, particular site up in Stokes County, right there in the red dot, had um, specific questions about their wells because the people who were tested were, showed a lot of contamination, and then they, they didn't increase the testing beyond the, the site, so there were a lot more people that had, had questions about testing we could do the testing through our lab. We could also, because we're at UNC, we can keep the results confidential. So if you remember a second ago, I was talking about this big data set that had all these results in it. Well, if you were in North Carolina um, and you build a new well or you get it tested through the state, it goes up online. So we were able to keep those results confidential. Um, and, and I should also mention that there are no other requirements other than if you build a new uh, well. There's no requirements for testing your wells. Um, if you find something, you don't have to treat your water. The only real mechanism that I know of is if you have lead in your water and it shows up in a blood lead level test for your child, that might actually trigger some action. But otherwise, it's like the wild, wild west. There are no regulations that apply to private wells. Um, construction, and you know, after they're built and, and permitted, there's, they basically operate with, you know, under the, the guise or under the management of the private landowner which is, you know, very, very often means that they go neglected and they're very infrequently tested. Actually, about half the wells that are out there are, are tested, and so most of them, unfortunately, go untested. So we had this opportunity. I was, I was in, you know, talking to this person from Stokes County. She invited me up to Stokes, um, and we were talking to the community, and they had a lot of questions about their private wells and, you know, tip metals that they'd already documented, specifically things like naturally occurring metals, like arsenic, but then other metals that generally are not naturally occurring, like chromium-6 and some other metals. Um, I should also just say at the beginning that all this work that I'm talking about is really talking about heavy, uh, inorganic metals. Um, and so we know that there's a lot of other questions out there that I'm not going to address today, like from PFAS or the Gen X question, uh, a lot of questions about drinking water and... Um, PFAS or fluorinated compounds like the Teflons that are showing up in a lot of the waters. And not just water, but um, uh, s municipal systems in our food, it's showing up in bee pollen and in beer, and I'll just stop there. So we only looked at those metals. There's also some other stuff folks are concerned about these days, especially around here uh, with radiological metals showing up in groundwater wells. We, I'm not going to be able to address that today, but that's, again, just another layer of concern communities have about their water. So in addition to kind of being, being invited to the community, which is really the first most important thing, you can't just sh parachute in as an academic and hit the ground and be like, we're here to save everybody and then disappear and do some lab tests and then maybe send them results. You have to be really, you have to be invited. You have to be, you know, they have to want you there. But then um, we like to also rely on what's called community engaged research strategies or bi-directional dis research design, um, co-created knowledge, basically making sure that we don't act like we have all the answers before we even get there and that we, we we're open to, to learning new ideas. And so we, we actually had some of these meetings where this, the community helped us think through the study. Um, we had lots of different team meetings. And I'll tell you about some of the, the results from that in a sec. So we wanted to test specifically for these metals in the water. Um, to do that, we, uh, like I said, we had this community engaged research model. We had people in there to help us think about the study. One of the main questions they had was, well, yeah, we, you know, we, we're concerned about our drinking water wells, but what about after the water comes through the well and comes through all this premise plumbing? We're hearing about flint and corrosion and metal uh, coming through their drinking water. So what about, like, what if you test our wells and it turns out, like, our well's fine, but we're still drinking a lot of contaminants from the pipes, the premise plumbing. So we, because of that direct concern, we built a, what's called a first draw sample into the study design so that when somebody takes the, the well water sample, um, they do it in the morning after it's, the pipes have basically been stagnant all night. And so the first drop of water is really going to give you a good idea of what's coming out of the pipes, the corrosion. Another question they had was, well, you know, that's great. We want to know about our wells, and it's good that you're going to do the premise plumbing. But what happens if we're spraying these, you know, the water on our, 
our gardens or community gardens. And for many of these communities, community gardens are a really important way to, to put um, food on the table. So we also incorporated, because we were at the right place at the right time and had some of the right networking, networking uh, we brought, put in a, built in a soil sample analysis. So we were able to sample a lot of the soils, and we make sure we did the sampling at the direction of where the community partners wanted us to do it. So if we were at home, we were like, generally, where should we sample? And we encouraged folks to think about where children were playing, where they might have gardens. So that's, those are two of the things that we added, the first draw sample and the soil sampling. Um, we also, before we even started, we wanted to make sure that we, we built the study out from the impacted community, the folks that had invited us there, but to really make a good study, we had to, of course, include as much data as possible, and so we opened it up to the entire county. Um, and to do that, we, got, we were fortunate enough to get the data set from the Department of Health and Human Services of all the private well owners. Um, I also dug, <laughs> got my poor students to go through the, the, the data set and pull all the most recent well tests, and we sent everybody a survey and said, look, um, if you want to be a part of the study, kind of fill this out, and then you know, they had to hit a couple of key things, like you actually have a private well, and you actually drink from it. A lot of people have private wells, but they don't necessarily drink from it anymore because they've moved over to municipal systems. That's still important, and it does help get a better understanding of some of the patterns of con contamination. But we have limited resources. We can't survey everybody, so we wanted to make sure we were getting to the people who needed it most, which were folks drinking their water, especially with people with children in their homes. So we surveyed everybody. We were able to kind of glean from that a couple uh, different samples. And um, like I said, we had the first draw sample, which is something that is kind of a, essentially a citizen science mechanism. It's the opportunity to, uh, to get the, the people involved in the study so that they're actually taking the sample. So in the morning, we obviously could not get up to Stokes County at 6 in the morning when people are waking up and taking that first draw sample. So it was kind of, by default, a requirement that we included this soil or uh, self-sampling or citizen sample technique. Citizen science is a really interesting new phenomenon. I'm sure you guys are hearing all about it. This is kind of how it was starting for us. It was kind of organic. It basically you know, happened by default. But we also wanted to make sure that we were testing the wells and that the, you know, the citizen sampling was done in a way that was accurate and valid and that we could look at another um, data set. So we also included a, a well draw. So to do that, um, we worked with uh, the Vengosh lab at Duke University, and I think he's in the most current uh, issue of Science Magazine. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, the, I think it's the article he wrote basically talking about some of his work on metals. Vengosh is a great scientist, and we, we pulled him in, and he was, he was able to help us get a well sample, and he was also able to test for some of these metals that were really difficult to, to find, like chromium-6. He had a way of basically um, purging the water for 20 minutes. So that's us uh, on a frigid morning, purging the water. Um, we, of course, sent people their first draw bottles, and we went and picked them up in the morning. But then we had to do a well purge. And that took like 20 minutes, because according to Van Gosh, it was important to make sure that we cleared all the standing water that had been sitting in the, wa in the well, and then make sure that you know, we had tested it to make sure that the, the different levels are stabilized, social scientist. And then they were able to. Uh, take a sample and then compare it to the sample that we got from the community and we actually saw that there was very little difference. Um, when we did a flush draw sample in the home, it was very similar to the, the kind of data that we're seeing from, coming from the, from the well draw. But um, this was already kind of built into the study so we were moving with this approach. And then of course I mentioned the soil samples. So just to give you an idea of what we're talking about for the, for the citizen sampling or the self-sampling uh, component, we basically asked them to do a, no, uh, a first draw sample where they didn't use their water all night. Sometimes that's more difficult than you might imagine. Um, you know, I've actually done a first draw sample for my home, and yeah, I had to literally duct tape my toilet so my kids wouldn't get in there and flush it. Um, they're, you know, they're, it's easy to, to mess up, but we've, we've seen that it works relative, you know, really well. In fact, out of, like, out of, I won't give away the, the, the story here, but um, at the end of the study, we saw very few actual samples that seemed to be evidence of you know, improper sampling. And then we asked them to flush their water for five minutes. Um, and that took, that next bottle was the, um, the flush draw sample. And then that little bottle there, we added to the study later on, which was um, incorporated be, by, at the advice after working with the, the Edwards Lab in Virginia Tech, who said, you don't have to actually flush your water for 15, you know, 15 20 minutes, mm -hmm. which basically you know, really uh, was a time limiter, limiter rate limiter, and so, so that instead of 
you know, going to the home, we could like schedule three different tri you know, homes per trip. We'd get to one home, we'd flush the water for 20 minutes, and we'd take a survey, we'd survey the community, we'd take some samples, and we'd go to the next home. And generally, we'd get like two or three, maybe four, if we're lucky, five homes per trip. And so um, this allowed us to get that, that same analysis, that same data from that little bottle, because in that little bottle, there's a little preservative at the bottom, and that allowed it to lock in so that it wouldn't sh shift over from chromium-6 to chromium-3, and we'd have a really good idea of what, what's potential uh, exposure in the well. Um, we also, just to give you guys an idea, we also, like I said, we went into the communities that needed support and wouldn't necessarily be able to um, either hear about some of our sampling in initiatives or maybe not, you know, f weren't able to make it to the drop-off location. So we went in several of these communities door-to-door -door in some of the, the communities that needed the most assistance. And again, like I mentioned, we're talking about communities that are already dealing with a legacy of pollution, um, uh, you know, by, by virtue of the fact that segregation has pushed many of these communities to the margins of these towns, that's where also the infrastructure stops, and so a lot of them were on wells, as, you know, at, because of that history of segregation. Um, this is a picture of me in uh, following Hurricane Florence, where we were doing a lot of studies, uh, and we were sampling water there. So we, we made sure that we included a door-to-door -door sampling technique so we would go to these homes and give them the bottle and then come pick them up the next morning and make it as easy as possible. A lot of them don't have smartphones, and you know, it's, it's, if, if, you, if you only rely on Facebook or social media, you're missing a really important part of the picture. And then, in addition to that, we complemented that by saying, okay, we're going to target these communities that we know we want to put in the study and that know we need to have well testing that aren't getting their wells tested and that might be exposed to um, industrials or anthropogenic metals or geogenic metals. But then also we opened the doors throughout the county to anybody who wanted to come pick up a well sample. And this is kind of how it was starting to evolve. Um, we, we included the EJ recruiting, and we did a countywide sample clinic. Um, we sent it to, actually, we didn't do a countywide, countywide clinic, the first one in, in Stokes County. We went door to door, took us about a year or so to get about 40 samples done. And, um, you know, we felt like, we said we were going to do 40. We got 40. At the end of the day, we have, you know, we've got a couple papers out there that, are, that talk about what we found. But um, let's say we've improved our methods. And so we also... Stokes County, and then we, we use the same methods in Wayne County. Uh, again, Wayne County is, um, it's near, we were doing predominantly near uh, Goldsboro. There was a community there that had a lot of c concerns about potential exposure from uh, industrial facilities there. Um, so we incorporated a first draw bottle, but we were still doing this flush draw, so this well purge that took forever. And then that's us like in the middle of you know, the summer, taking soil samples. It was really hot. We got only 12 samples there, okay? so. We started working, we, 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 we gave up on the, fl the well flush because we, were no we could tell that there wasn't ma a major difference in the sampling results. And so then we switched over to another uh, approach. This, um, we, we targeted Robeson County and New Hanover County because uh, around this time last year, actually, I'm a, I guess we just passed the one year anniversary of Hurricane Florence, right? Last week, I think. Um, Right even before the hurricane hit, uh, the Edwards lab and one of the people from their lab who um, was a really helpful kind of uh, mentor for me for a lot of this work, Kelsey Piper, uh, they were saying, you know, we've got this new technique. We, don't, we can use these new bottles. We'll do citizen sampling. You don't have to flush draw for an hour for 20 minutes and hang around the house for so long, and you can get a lot more well sampled. Um, and we can do it in the communities that need it most from this hurricane impact. And so we wrote an, what's called a rapid response grant, an NSF rapid. Uh, we actually had it in the paperwork before Hurricane Florence even hit. Um, so uh, not too far after that, we got, this, we got the grant and we were able to basically bring the Virginia Tech lab in. We stopped working with the, with the, uh, the Duke University lab because we, we felt like this new approach gave us good valid results, but we could get a lot more people tested. So we included uh, an EJ, kind of environmental justice, door-to-door -door approach, as well as a countywide approach. And that basically meant we tell everybody, if you want your well tested for free, come to this, town, come to this meeting. So, uh, in Robinson County, um, as I'm sure you all are familiar with, the Lumbee Tribe, we, worked, we partnered really closely with the North Carolina uh, Lumbee Tribal Administration. They let us use their vet center and a different other locations. And so we basically opened the doors all day long, and people could come get a, get a kit. And so you can see this is basically what the kits look like. So they just come grab one of these kits. Um, I'll pass that around. And then uh, we, um, we asked them to go home, take that first draw sample in the morning, take a flush draw sample, and then come on back, fill out the survey. And the most important part of the survey 
is that we make sure that we have the kits matched with the survey, the bottle, so we don't send somebody back the wrong results. But the other port, there are a lot of other important parts of the survey, like have you tested your water before? That's my favorite one, because the majority of folks have never tested their water. Um, and then, you know, have you gotten like a do not drink letter or some of these things that, that are interesting to folks who think about, you know, communities that are reliant on wells. Um, so they, they dropped off their kits the next day. We got a bunch of well sampled in, in I think, two months. So it took us two, about a year and a half, maybe two years, to get 60 samples from Stokes and Wayne. We got about 90 in a month. Um, and this is also in a community that uh, we were told, I won't say which agency, but they were like, oh, don't bother coming down here. There's nobody, there, nobody has wells and nobody wants any well testing. And they are actually in the top quartile for the percentage of wells in a community. <laughs> and the bottom as far as like the like third or fourth to the bottom as far as the percentage of people with wells who actually test their wells. So we actually got a pretty good response and we felt like we were, we were providing it to a community that needed it most. Um, this is us in front of a home that had been flooded. Uh, I also should say that I'm partnered not only with the Lumbee Tribe, we also work really closely with the North Carolina Extension Offices um, and also with the North Carolina River Keepers. Really important group, uh, shoestring budget, working 12 hours a day, willing to come out and help me go into these, some of these communities where um, I probably would not have necessarily been invited uh, and that I would have probably been okay, but it was really great to have this guy, Jeff Curry, who's the North Carolina River Keeper, or Robinson River Keeper, Lumbee River Keeper. Um, and so he helped get us kind of doing the door to door while we also had these well clinics. Um, like I said, we were incorporating the citizen sampling approach and it worked out really well. And we just dropped the whole well purge and there's no soil sampling at this time. Also, under the Hurricane Florence uh, Rapid Response Grant, we were also sampling in New Hanover County. There was also an existing industrial site there, coal ash facility that people were concerned about that had gotten heavily flooded by Hurricane Florence, um, which we'd actually written into the grant before it even happened. We were like, we're concerned that this might happen, and we want to study if it does, and it did happen, and we were actually able to get about 77 samples there. Um, again, uh, we went door to door in some of the communities that were, that were um, less likely to respond to a news report on the, you know, the television station necessarily. Uh, we included soil sampling, and we, I'm sorry, citizen sampling, and we dropped the well purge and the soil sample. Also, as part of this rapid res response grant, we also saw Hurricane Michael hit right after Hurricane Florence, and it went on the eastern part, or the western part of the state, and um, Although there wasn't necessarily an environmental justice community that was asking for us to help them out, there was an quote unquote impacted community that was really concerned about uh, a, what appeared to be a thyroid cancer cluster in the community um, in Iredell County. Uh, there's still a lot of questions about where it's coming from. Um, they wanted us to come in and sample wells because uh, there was some concern that maybe uranium might be an explanation for what might be happening. Um, and so we, we got 800 wells sampled there in about a month. So remember, 40 in Stokes County over a year and a half, and then in about a month, and actually like we collected all of them and within a week and a half. Uh, that's us at five in the morning, and they, they literally had to like have the police shepherd people coming in and dropping off their bottles from their cars. It took seven hours, because what we would do is we would take the sample, we'd do a pH probe, because uh, over time the, the pH will stabilize, so you want to get the probe as quick as possible. Um, we had to do all this analysis in the morning, uh, it was a long day, but we got 800 wells uh, done. 800 wells done, and I should say that really is all. Uh, it's all because of the, uh, the the Edwards lab. They they worked incredible hours, and they never messed up a sample. They made sure that people got the results back that that you know that were a part of the study. Um, they didn't lose any bottles. They they were amazing. Um, and then most most recently, we kind of learned from all these different experiences, and we included in Chatham County, another community approached us who said, you know, we have this concern about a, an improperly permitted landfill that's right in the middle of Moncure, Chatham County, which is not too far from here. Um, again, uh, low socioeconomic status, community of color, uh, uh, dealing with a disproportionate burden of pollution. So all around the community, there are already like six or seven different major industrial facilities. They just added a new coal ash facility landfill um, that the, most recently the judge said was not properly permitted because it was permitted as a beneficial reuse of the land when it was essentially just landfill. So anyway, that's going on. They have all these questions about their exposure to some of this groundwater well, uh, contamination. Meanwhile, I should also say that they started burning the coal ash there and they call it Beneficence. Um, anyway, it's an interesting way of describing incineration. So 
long story short, they had a lot of questions. We were able to, to like cut through a lot of the different um, political stuff and the noise about, you know, uh, you know, there are a lot of different lawsuits that were emerging. We just wanted to get to the community and sample as many wells as possible. You know, um, they, had, they definitely wanted us to tell us, you know, well, where is this coming from? They wanted us to, you know, to point a finger to basically where, you know, who was responsible for it. But that really wasn't our first task. Our first task was to get people's wells tested and tell them what's in their water. Um, a lot of the community had never tested their wells. So we, fortunately enough, had a couple really cool uh, partners. There's also, in this case, the environmental um, nonprofit that we worked with was called the Bredel, the Blue Ridge Environmental Defense League, who I knew since the 1990s. And so I, I felt like we had a really interesting team. And then that's actually some of my students there helping me on a <laughs> 6 o'clock in the morning on a on a Thursday down in, in Moncure collecting samples. And so we got about 240 samples there. We had originally hoped to get 40, and that was before we, we um, were able to move over to this new strategy, okay? Uh, so be careful what you wish for. So in addition to um, doing all the sampling, like I mentioned, uh, there's like the targeted sampling or traditional sampling where we did the purge, and that's these first communities over here where we got you know, over basically two years, we got 60 samples, and then um, Robinson, New Hanover, these are the Florence, Hurricane Florence samples, and these over here were generally, well, this is the Hurricane Michael sample in Iredell County where uh, the hurricane came through and washed out a lot of roads which had been built on top of structural fill, which was another interesting name for coal ash. And then Chatham County, which um, we were able to uh, get a bunch of well sample there, and we felt like, you know, we, we were improving our strategy. And so right now what we're trying to do is think about how we can make it even better. And what we've been doing recently is instead of having um, like a, a, a countywide well clinic, which we'll still do, we just have been sending people bottles who sign up online or who are recruited through a door-to-door -door canvas. And that way we can kind of um, get more bottles to more folks. And most recently we, we've been working with a community up in Northampton County um, who have a lot of questions about drinking water wells. And there's also uh, existing buried industrial waste in that area as well. So uh, right, right now what we're doing is actually just in the last couple of days, we've got 100 people that signed up. Uh, while we're signing them up online, there's also people going door to door and recruiting folks. Um, and I think we have a really good method of bringing people into study. Again, we do it for free. We also make sure that all the results are confidential. And then we also um, share the results in a way that doesn't disclose who was in the study. But you know, we send the people your individual results. So if you're in the study, you definitely get your own results back. But then we make sure that we summarize what we found across the community so that people in the study, but people in the community can come and learn about what we found. So these are called generally report back meetings. Um, and so this is one in Chatham County uh, where we had like 100 people show up for that. And then another one in, um, you know, we've done this in every community where, like I said, it's important that you don't, you know, the community engaged research means that you come in and you're invited and you do it uh, in a way that's respectful for the community, but then also you don't just disappear, you have to come back and tell folks what you found, all right? Um, I thought that would seem pretty logical, but it apparently doesn't happen as much as it should. Uh, in fact, it doesn't happen very much at all. Um, so you guys are the future or the current research specialists. Please help me make sure this is, becomes more common. Um, but we basically come back to the community and we summarize the results. And I have some here that I will share with just a second. Uh, these first ones are, uh, are, are okay for public distribution. But um, just to give you an example, some of the results in Chatham County, and again, I'm kind of, I'm doing two things here. I'm kind of explaining how we find this stuff, but then also for you all, you live really close here. This is kind of an interesting uh, example of what we found. Um, a lot of these results here, these two lead, and there's lead and copper, um, were some of the most concerning health-based metals that we found, and a lot of them, we found them primarily because we did that first draw sample. Um, when the state does a sample, they come out to your home, they generally come to your well and they flush the well for five minutes and then they take a sample. We asked people to take a sample from their kitchen tap on that first draw, so we had a really good idea what happens um, to people when they're drinking their water. Generally, folks don't flush their water for five minutes when they start their morning. There's also some other things we want to just give folks a heads up about, like you know, things that are generally called nuisance-based metals, so um, manganese and iron. Manganese can also potentially be you know, um, a health concern. But some of these other metals at low levels are generally you know, triggered when, uh, it, because it's a, a nuisance. So like it might make your, you know, your clothes turn brown or you might have a weird taste in your water. Um, then there's these other two here. Uh, and this is, the, this is the interesting part. These are the health goals. And so for the 
uh, for National Safe Drinking Water Act regulations, the government sets a federal standard, and that standard is based on health requirements and health concerns and health data, but it also incorporates feasibility, technical capacity, and financial capacity, like whether or not they can actually implement some of these huge filter systems. And so it's kind of a compromise. And so they, they start with the health results. And so like, for example, arsenic, we know that arsenic is, or like lead, lead has zero, you, you don't want any lead in your water. Um, and just to help explain some of this, I have an example. This is actually a modified example of one of the surveys or some of the results that we hand out to folks that, that's kind of like a cheat sheet or you know, a read along where um, we try to explain some of these metals. And they're all generally easy to understand, but the ones that are diff most difficult are these North Carolina health-based goals. And again, like I said, for the federal standards, they incorporate all this other stuff, these kind of cost-benefit analyses and these trade-offs in order to set a standard. But for the health-based goals, specifically for CR6, chromium-6, and vanadium, there are no federal standards. In fact, there are no real set state standards. There's no um, what's generally called a groundwater standard. But after the coal ash spill in 2014, the government said, the General Assembly said, yeah, you need to go and provide free well tests around each one of these communities. And we know generally that coal ash has chromium-6 in it and vanadium in it. So you should incorporate that into your analysis. But they didn't realize at the time that there's no real health-based uh, standards. There's definitely no MCL, federal MCL. And there's no state goal, goal, goal. So they had to basically follow this checklist that says, OK, well, what's the first thing on the checklist? Well, what is a, what? Um, level, what's the level at which this metal becomes carcinogenic uh, for someone at, you know, at a one in a million risk? And so that's for the chromium-6. They set that standard at 0.07 parts per billion. Uh, for vanadium, they set it at 0.3 parts per billion. And they didn't include any uh, feasibility analysis. In fact, they, they didn't say, you know, um, Here's the standard, but then make sure that you, know, you, you incorporate like, the ability to treat it in systems. These are only for private wells, and so there are no regulations for private wells. And so basically, they set this health-based goal, and that was it. Um, and from, a, from my standpoint, I just want to operate on whatever the best science, whatever the scientists say is the most health-protective measure, I'm going to roll with that, and I'm going to go into the communities and try to explain what I found. But as you can see, when you walk into a community here and you tell them that 84% of the wells have vanadium in it, it's alarming, and it can be, you know, we're talking about something that it's not like pizza, which, you know, you can pick a couple different slices or different kinds of soda or different shampoo bottles. We're talking about something that we draw up out of the earth and put in our bodies that we need every day. Um, I need pizza every day. But the point is, um, this is kind of a complex thing that is sensitive, and, and it's, it's, you know, you tell people that you have, you've got contaminated water, it is really alarming and terrifying. Um, but we also make sure that we incorporate some things that help explain, you know, ways to address it and interventions, which I'll talk about in a second. So these were the health-based goals. Uh, and for Chatham County, we found that chromium-6 in about half of the wells. And that, the next day, as soon as after this, press, this uh, report back meeting, the, the news was all talking about how half of the wells in North Carolina or in Chatham County are in, uh, contaminated with chromium-6. And it's true, but it's at a 0.07 level, which is, the state says 0.07 is, is carcinogenic over a lifetime of drinking a liter of it as an adult male. And then the feds say 100 is, is problematic. So there's this huge gray area, this huge gap in understanding and communicating this stuff. Um, but what we basically try to do is say, you know, this is what the, this is what the, the health-based research, research says. This is what the state says, and this is what the federal sa says. Whatever your results are, here, and then we can go right into the filter. Here's a filter that we've tested that we know works, OK? So we try to avoid something like, for example, when they set that 0.07, uh, they, the state originally said, OK, 0.07, who's got 0.07? Oh, they've got, all these people have 0.07. But, you know, they tr they're above 0.07 parts per billion for chromium-6. They send all these do not drink letters all over the state. And then they, they got this crazy, you know, this reaction from, from communities that were really upset. And so you know, I won't talk about any different groups. But one um, person uh, said, well, let's just change the standard. And they bumped it up. And then, so then uh, mag magically, all these people's water was now clean. And so they sent out these letters, said, oh, actually, you can go ahead. You can drink your water. So they went from don't drink. Well, they went from I don't know about my water. They went from don't drink your water. Then they were like, oh, it's OK. It's OK. Drink your water. Then they actually had to come back and say, no, actually, you shouldn't drink your water. 
And then for some of those people, they had some really high levels. They, they, they had to do some other interventions. So it's, it's a really complex picture, you know, picture. It's difficult to explain how these different regulations apply in different ways. We just explain what we found, um, and then we go right into some of the health interventions. And then we also helped, it also helps to kind of show you know, what your well might look like throughout the community. So this is an example of, again, where these are all the different results for, um, I want to say Chatham County. Yeah, this is Chatham County. We had 15, right above the 15 parts per billion for lead. Again, though, you don't want any lead in your water, right? Especially if you have kids or vulnerable populations in your home. Um, but this, the federal level is actually not even a MCL. It's called a treatment technique, which basically means if you have more than 10% of the population above 15 parts per billion, then you have to act on something. But if below 10% of the population is not triggering that, you don't have to do anything, which is what happened in Flint. In Flint, Michigan, bless you, they said, okay, um, we have people that are right at 10 parts, you know, some people have some really high heart, really high um, lead in their water, there, we have more than 10% you know, of the population drinking this contaminated water, so we're going to have to act on it. And I think what really kind of was the, the scandalous thing that happened is that some of these samples disappeared and they got below that level again. Um, for us, we again, we just say we don't want any of this in your water. These, this, is the, this is the federal standard um, and this is the average that we found, and so it kind of at least puts it in some context. And again, this is lead, so this is generally not um, uh, geogenic. It doesn't come out of the ground, so they're, it's either coming from an industrial site or more likely from somebody's home. Same thing with hexavalent chromium. We try to explain kind of what, you know, here's the state health goal. Uh, when, I, when I explain this, I'm like, here's the health goal, you know, down here, you know, here was our average. We were double the average um, for what the health goal recommends, but the federal, the state level is way up here at 10, and then the federal level is way over here at 100. So we try to at least, you know, contextualize it so that we're communicating what needs to be said, but not necessarily sending people into a panic. Then we also try to explain what we found for, for, you know, across the state for some of these other communities. Um, so again, I mentioned I said about 50% of the community in Chatham County had wells above that level. Uh, less so in Robinson and New Hanover, but then a whole lot more in Iredell. Um, could be naturally occurring, could be industrial, it could be somebody who was you know, unscrupulous and dumped it down a hole in the 1940s. Uh, it could be all three of those things, and honestly, like I've, I, I try to just avoid that whole sourcing explanation and go right into, here's what we found, here's a potential intervention. Um, but people definitely want to know what's going on, and, and if some of the best available science, for example, for hexavalent chromium says that it's, uh, it doesn't naturally occur, then another scientist says, well, it does naturally occur, but not in the coast, but then we, you can see we found you know, a quarter of the wells on the coast had hexavalent chromium in it. So there's so many more questions that, that pop up through the study that uh, I'm excited to see how we're able to answer them, and hopefully we can. Um, again, same thing with vanadium. Vanadium is one of these metals that is not carcinogenic, fortunately, but we found it in like 80% of the wells, so we try to explain it. Um, there's, again, the, the, the statewide kind of explanation. So like I said, in addition to explaining the results, bringing people into a room, and, and giving them an opportunity to talk one-on-one -on -one with the scientists, and then hear a summary of what we found, we also try to uh, do, a, do a, job, a good job um, giving some kind of uh, treatment system or, or explanation of how to avoid some of this exposure. So flushing your water, believe it or not, you know, if you have a lot of lead in your pipes, if you flush your water for five minutes, it actually reduces it by like tenfold. So you can reduce your exposure just by flushing it, which is a, you know, if you're on a well, you're not paying for the, you know, the, the water itself necessarily. Um, so flushing it is a, you know, easy first solution. Then there's this other uh, solution called a pitcher filter. Um, and I'll just say off the front, I, am no, I have no investment, I have no financial investment in zero water pitcher filters, but we had heard about them. Uh, they were testing them out in Dartmouth and they t made sure that they worked in Dartmouth on arsenic. And then the Fry Lab that I work with at, through the Superfund program tested it on, on arsenic and lead and it turned out it worked really good with lead, really well with lead. And then also um, we tested it through the Edwards Lab to make sure it worked on chromium-6. Inexpensive filter, uh, it works on, worked really well on all those metals. Um, it dropped it below detection level for each one of them. And, and that was like some of these things were spiked with 1,000 parts per billion and it got it way really you know, low. It's a $40 system. Um, it's you know, accessible. You can buy it online or you can get it through you know, your local uh, stores. And we felt like you know, we could potentially use these, and so I actually called the company. I'm like, hey, we've got all these wells that got hit by Hurricane Florence. We've tested your, your, your uh, 
your uh, system out and we know it works. Can we get some at half price? And they were like, okay, fine. So they gave us like 200, 200, well, they gave us 100 at half price. I'm like, well, can we get another 100 for free? And they're like, okay, fine. <laughs> so negotiation, that's like just ask for way more than you want and you sometimes might get it. Um, so we got a, like hundreds, uh, 230 of these filters. We gave them out to all the homes, especially those with the high arsenic levels and high lead levels and chromium levels. Um, we felt like that's a good temporary solution, but going into these communities, the first thing that I, I learned the hard way is that we have to explain, this is not a permanent solution. If you have you know, heavy metals in your, coming out of your pipes, you're going to have to address that at some point or maybe change your pipes or somehow maybe get on city water. Um, it also doesn't necessarily test for radiologicals or filter out... Um, some of these other PFAS metals, although we're hearing that it might. So stay tuned on that. And of course, the last option that we recommend is uh, you can also switch to bottled water. Bottled water is not necessarily cheaper. In fact, it's way more expensive than a filter over time. And it's not necessarily uh, healthier. So I'll just stop there because I know we're drinking a lot of it. <laughs> um, and then there's also some other systems like reverse osmosis systems that are, um, that are more expensive, but then actually if you can maintain them and, and you know, change the filter over time, you can actually get pretty clean water out of a relatively inexpensive system. So like a $200 system underneath your faucet might work. Uh, reverse osmosis is different than this zero water one that we use. The zero water is activated carbon. Um, reverse osmosis does kind of sorbent membranes, social science. So we like to just recommend at the front, like, here's your first solution right away. Here's a filter, take it. And then we actually send them replacement filters and we use the replacement filter, like the cartridge that you kind of take the one out and you put the new one in. And we ask them to, um, to fill out a survey so we, can, so we can get some data on, you know, what's been going on with their wells and how, how they're, you know, treating their water. If they've done anything from the contaminants, have they, have they done anything post, it's called an actions taken survey. So those are kind of the experiences that we, okay. Those are essentially the, the approaches that we use. Um, Lessons learned, uh, we've, we've been able to really make sure that we get a lot of good uh, responses. And so the, you know, when we hand out 150 bottles, we usually get about uh, you know, 145 back. So we get a good response rate. Um, of course, increased sample size. The more you know, points of data that we have, the better ability we have at making predictions about what might be happening, greater power. And then, of course, be careful what you wish for. When we switch from the door-to-door -to, -door to the handing out free kits, like one of these times we had 300 people show up and we only had 100 bottles. So that was a fun day. So that's it. I just want to thank my community partners who help, like all the people in the field that make it happen, and then my team at UNC, Virginia Tech, and our funders. So thank you guys very much.